Okay. Uh, good morning, guys. Uh, so we're going to be doing the current affairs for twenty third now. Okay. Uh, some of the topics that we're going to be discussing today are related to the AFSPA removal in Nagaland. Uh, AFSPA is nothing but the Armed Forces Special Powers Act. Forces Act. Okay. It gives draconian powers to the armed forces in uh, some of the northeastern states as well as Jammu and Kashmir. Now the fourth phase of elections in Uttar Pradesh are happening. Uh, we know that uh, the Uttar Pradesh elections has uh, five phases in it, and the fourth phase elections are going on currently. Midday meal scheme will resume only after hundred percent attendance in Delhi. It seems. Okay. India also sends a batch of aid to Afghanistan. India sends wheat to Afghanistan. Uh, and uh, okay. So PM Cares scheme for COVID uh, children has been extended. Nepal will be the first foreign country to adopt India's UPI system. So these are the important topics. One, two, three, four, and five, six. Okay. So the others are pretty much uh, static, and you can go through them uh, yourself. I'll give a brief overview on them as well. How? Okay. Now, uh, recently, what happened was uh, in Nagaland there was a brief misunderstanding between the armed forces and between some of the informal coal workers in Nagaland, and because of the uh, misunderstanding between them, the armed forces ended up opening fire on those coal workers, thus killing them in the process. They were suspected for being uh, separatists, and they were killed in the Mon district. in nagaland and hence because of this there was a lot of public outrage against the armed forces and hence in order to deal with that pu public outrage and also to hold the armed forces accountable the union home ministry in december they decided to study the withdrawal of the armed forces special powers act or afspa from nagaland and uh, they asked this committee to submit its uh, report within 45 days however the panel that has been formed it still has not submitted its uh, its report despite uh, after 45 days now what is afspa okay afspa is nothing but it's a parliamentary act that gives unfettered powers to the armed forces and the central armed police forces okay please do read what the central armed police forces are there are six central armed police forces like uh, the assam rifles like the indo tibetan border police like the sahastra seema bal uh, the border security force crpf and cisf okay so please read more about who these forces report to and who their commanding ministry is okay now this afspa is actually deployed in disturbed areas to kill anyone acting in contravention of law and order and search any premises without a warrant and with protection from prosecution and legal suits to the army so the army even if it kills anyone who are acting against law and order and it can also search any premises without any warrant okay all these functions are actually provided security from prosecution by afspa and hence what it does is that it gives army unfettered powers without sufficient amount of accountability so what happens if the army uses it for its own uh, if people use it for personal vengeance or if people in the army go on a rampage killing others unaccountable powers cannot be given to anyone because uh, people can use it for personal ends 
Now, the law first came into effect in 1958 to deal with the uprising in the Naga Hills, followed by insurgency in Assam, first in Naga Hills and then in Assam. Hence, the AFSPA was actually created in 1958. However, in 1972, the, the power to declare an area as a disturbed area were conferred upon the center also. Now, both the center and the states can declare the AFSPA, any region as AFSPA. Current status of that. Currently, the Union Home Ministry issues periodic disturbed area notification to extend AFSPA for Nagaland Arunachal Pradesh. Who does it? It's the Union Home Ministry who does it in the case of Nagaland and Arunachal Pradesh. So even if uh, someone has to revoke the AFSPA, it has to be the Union Home Ministry. While the notification for Manipur and Assam is given by the state governments. So in the case of Nagaland and Arunachal Pradesh, it is the Home Ministry. And in the case of Manipur and Assam, it is by the state governments. Now, Tripura was also earlier under the AFSPA Act, but it revoked the Act after many years of peace. And Meghalaya was also under AFSPA for 27 years until it was revoked on 1st April 2018. It is to be remembered that Jammu and Kashmir has a separate Jammu and Kashmir Armed Forces Special Powers Act. It is not under AFSPA. It is under a different Armed Forces Special Powers Act, which is the Jammu and Kashmir one. Now, what are the problems that are surrounding the act? The law empowers security personnel, even non-commissioned officers, to use force and shoot even to the causing of death if they are convinced that it is necessary to do so for the maintenance of public order. Now, this is a very vague statement. It gives too many powers to the security forces. And we are talking about even non-commissioned officers, people who are not in the commissioned uh, cadre. Okay. It also grants soldiers executive powers to enter premises, search and arrest without a warrant. The exercise of these extraordinary powers by armed forces has often led to allegations of fake encounters and other human right violations by security forces in disturbed areas while questioning the indefinite imposition of AFSPA. Imagine, first it was introduced in the year 1958 okay, and now it is 2022. It is still in place. So it is... It has been there for an extremely long period of time. Uh, there was also a commission called the Jeevan Reddy Commission, which was Mr. Jeevan Reddy was a former Supreme Court judge. So he, under him, a commission was formed to look into the validity of Armed Forces Special Powers Act, and this commission recommended that the act should be abolished. abolish the act and uh, give arrest people under UAPA after making sufficient changes to UAPA. That was the recommendation of this particular commission. Next, fourth phase of election in Uttar Pradesh today. 59 assembly constituencies spread over 9 districts will vote in the fourth phase of Uttar Pradesh assembly elections. Now, Whenever elections are being conducted, what are the acts which govern the conduct of these elections? It is the Representation of People's Act of 1950 and the Representation of People's Act of 1951. Now, this particular act usually deals with all the processes before the conduct of elections, like preparation of electoral rolls. while this particular act governs with the conduct of the elections itself, such as prevention of rigging, such as uh, uh, disqualification criteria for members and all the others. Okay, So please know what are the main functions under these different, different acts. Now, this election machinery is given under the 1951 act. Why? Because 1951 act is concerned with the conduct of the elections. Okay, next, under, okay, um, the Election Commission of India is uh, a commission formed under Article 324 itself, but most of the other bodies, all the other bodies are formed, uh, they are given, they are formed as per directions under ROPA of 1951. Next, Election Commission of India, 
under article 324 the constitution of the constitution of india the election commission of india is vested with the powers of superintendence direction control of conducting the elections to the lok sabha and the state legislative assembly who conducts the elections for panchayats and municipalities it's the state election commission even that is a constitutional body now it is the president of india who appoints the chief election commissioner and the election commissioners please read how a chief election commissioner can be removed and how election commissioners are removed also do read about various election processes that we have in india in india we follow the first past the post system whereas the other existing uh, methods are proportional voting uh, through single transferable vote and then you have list system okay you also have alternative alternating alternative vote system please read about these different different forms of voting next you have the chief electoral officer the chief electoral officer is usually the person who is in charge of conducting the elections at the state level at the entire state level okay now the chief electoral officer is authorized to supervise the election work in state ut subject to the overall superintendence of the election commission of india and it is the eci who nominates or designates an officer of the government of the state or ut as the chief electoral officer in consultation with the state government next we have the district election officer who works under the chief electoral officer and he supervises the election work in a district now it is again it is the eci who nominates or designates a person as a district election officer just like it is the eci who nominates the chief electoral officer now the most important officer in the entire electoral process is the returning officer why because he is the person who has to certify if the elections in a particular assembly assembly seat or a constituency seat are conducted appropriately without any rigging without any manipulation without any alcohol distribution money distribution he is the person who certifies the electoral process and he is the one who declares the result the returning officer of a parliamentary or a state assembly election is responsible for the conduct the election commission of india nominates or designates an officer of the government as a returning officer again the election commission only does it for each assembly and and parliamentary constituencies in consultation with the state government okay the election commission of india also appoints one or more assistant returning officers for each of the assembly and parliamentary constituencies to assist the returning officer next electoral registration officer the electoral registration officer is responsible for the preparation of the electoral rolls remember i told you about the electoral rolls okay the con- the preparation of the electoral rolls is governed by ropa okay but the 1950 but the person who is in charge of doing this work is the electoral registration officer hmm. and it is the eci election commission of india who appoints the electoral registration officer next we have the presiding officer so while the returning officer is the head of an assembly constituency it is the presiding officer who is the head of the polling station within one electoral assembly constituency you have many uh, polling stations so it is presiding officer who is the head of all these polling stations the district election officer appoints a presiding officer remember while the district election officer himself is appointed by the eci he is the person who appoints the presiding officers okay and in the case of union territories these uh, presiding officers are appointed by who the returning officer the returning officer is the person who is in charge of uh, elections within an assembly seat while district election officer is responsible for conduct of elections within the entire district itself okay bid day meals will resume after 100% attendance responding to criticism on not starting the mid day meal scheme despite opening of schools a week ago the delhi government said that it has been distributing dry rations instead the delhi government is saying that we are distributing dry rations to all the children instead of giving cooked meals because we don't have 100% attendance hmm. earlier the union cabinet committee on economic affairs uh, chaired by prime minister modi 
had actually renamed the midday meal scheme to be called as pm portion now what is portion it means pradhan mantri portion shakti nirman and nothing but a modified version of the midday meal scheme now please remember that there is a big difference between uh there is a big difference between uh, who performs what functions under the midday meal scheme okay uh while the center is responsible for center is responsible for procurement of rations transport costs it is the states which are responsible for actually cooking the meals uh paying of stipend to the cooks and all the other helpers paying cooks deciding the food that is served deciding what food is served deciding the menu so different units actually perform different functions within the midday meal scheme now the midday meal scheme under the ministry of education is a centrally sponsored scheme now please know the difference between centrally sponsored schemes and central sector schemes while centrally sponsored schemes are actually schemes which are shared between the center and the states in either ratios of 60 40 or 50 50 central sector schemes are completely funded by the center itself the states don't have to spend any money for those schemes it is the world's largest school meal program aimed to attain the goal of universalization in primary education why because when uh, you know the government announces that the government will provide meals to students they would definitely start attending schools thereby everyone can get education provides cooked meals to every child within the age group of 6 to 14 years this is the age group within rte also right to education studying in classes 1 to 8 who enrolls and attend school if the midday meal is not provided to school uh, in school on any day due to non availability of food grains or any other reason the state government shall pay food security allowance by the 15th of the succeeding month so if at all any school misses out on providing midday meal the state government has to provide an allowance before the 15th of the next month the state steering com monitoring committee every state has this steering com monitoring committee oversees the implementation of the scheme including establishment of a mechanism for maintenance of nutritional standards and quality of meals while the school management committees play a vital role in monitoring it and the implementation of the scheme is carried out by the state steering com monitoring committee okay while the monitoring is done by the school management committee the school management committee is actually formed under the right to education act within the school management committee there are people you know there are uh, eminent people from that particular uh, area who are a part of the school management committee parents of students are a part of the school management committee and its role is to actually verify if this mid day meal scheme is happening accordingly or it has to verify if the right to education act is being implemented correctly also agmar quality food items are only procured and provided under the mid day meal scheme and tasting of the meals is done by 2 to 3 adult members in the school management committee okay now cooked meal having nutritional standards of 450 calories and 12 grams of protein for primary and 700 calories and 20 grams of protein for upper primary this is the minimum requirement that is needed 450 calories for primary and 700 calories for upper primary okay next all the government and government aided schools madrasas maktabs all of them which are uh, sponsored under the sarva shiksha abhiyan are also under the mid day meal scheme now these meals are only served under the inside the school campus they cannot be served in different areas of the village or in different uh, places only within the school otherwise there is food grain diversion usually hence to prevent that they are only provided on the school premises so that students visit the schools next 
India sends first batch of aid to Afghanistan. All of us know that Afghanistan is in the middle of a crisis and hence India has been uh, trying to improve uh, the situation in Afghanistan by addressing this particular crisis. The Foreign Secretary of India, Mr. Harshwardhan Shingla. This is not needed, but I'm just telling. He is the person who flagged off a convoy of about 50 trucks carrying 2,500 tons of wheat as humanitarian aid for Afghanistan at the India-Pakistan Integrated Check Post. Okay, and you have to understand that there are, uh, it is a convoy of about 50 trucks. Okay, while around 1000 truckloads will be sent, 1000 truckloads will be sent of wheat uh, to Afghanistan. These 1000 truckloads will head to Jalalabad in Afghanistan. Okay, the wheat is expected to be sent across Afghanistan to help people deal with the crisis caused by food shortage and an economic collapse after the Taliban takeover of Kabul. Okay, uh, I am sure you know that a lot of people are facing uh, a humanitarian crisis in Afghanistan. According to the United, United Nations, uh, UN, UNCHR, okay, United Nations uh, Committee on Human Rights, uh, around half the population of Afghanistan is facing a food crisis. Okay, and hence this wheat is going to be extremely important. Now, the assistance was made in response to appeals made by United Nations for humanitarian assistance to Afghanistan, according to Ministry of External Affairs. The transshipment of wheat is happening after being suspended for nearly three years after the Balakot strikes and su subsequent skirmishes. Remember, after the Balakot strike happened, India had also removed the most favoured nation tag to Pakistan and we had started blocking India-Pakistan trade and hence as a result uh, these trucks which were travelling to Afghanistan through the Atari border were also stopped and since the last three years there has been no trade uh, between India and Pakistan. Okay. Uh, the wheat assistance will be delivered in multiple consignments and will be handed over to United Nations World Food Program in Jalalabad, Afghanistan. This marks an end to the delay in sending of wheat which was approved over months ago. See, this was actually approved in October itself. But till now, it has not been sent because of the delay caused by Pakistan. Okay. Uh, now, Pakistan... Uh, stopped it because uh, because of the animosity that India and Pakistan share with respect to Afghanistan. Okay, Pakistan does not want a two-front situation because it, it fears the presence of India and Afghanistan. It believes that it will create a two-front situation for it in uh, on either border. Say for example, this is India-Pakistan border. Pakistan also shares a border with Afghanistan. So this will create a two-front situation from by attacks from India and Afghanistan. If at all, India has enough strategic depth in Afghanistan. Also, uh, the border that exists between Pakistan and Afghanistan, uh, please search out the name of this particular border. It's a very important border. Uh, it was under the Britishers itself. So, I want you to find out the name of this border. It's very easy. Hmm. Uh, this particular border was actually done in a very unscientific way by the Britishers itself. And hence, the ethnic Pashtuns who exist, they are broken between Afghanistan and Pakistan. Some of them are on this side. Some of them are on this side. And hence, there are calls for these Pashtuns to create a separate Pashtunistan by taking areas of Pakistan such as the Northwest Frontier, some areas of Northwest Frontier Province, uh, Wazirabad, 
all of those areas some parts of balochistan and hence pakistan is uh, constantly scared about this happening it had earlier lost bangladesh and hence it does not want to lose any more territory and hence uh, pakistan is extremely scareful when it comes to uh, dealing of india with afghanistan pakistan's prime minister imran khan had announced that he would allow the transshipment of wheat as an exception but it has been delayed by the punjab elections and hence when the punjab elections got over around 2 uh, days back since then again this thing has picked up now we are sending wheat again it finally marks an end to months of bureaucratic wrangles between new delhi and islamabad however afghan trucks will only ply the route not indian trucks only afghan trucks have to come inside they will take the wheat and they will go back indian trucks cannot go to the other side so uh okay and uh, these particular drivers are given permits and not visas okay uh so earlier we also had a trade agreement between india afghanistan and pakistan which is known as the aptta now the aptta is nothing but afghanistan ap t t a there is nothing but the afghanistan pakistan transit trade agreement now as a part of this transit trade agreement this was signed in the year 2010 itself now as a part of this transit trade agreement trucks from afghanistan would come to wagha border and they would unload their uh, goods from afghanistan but these trucks could not be loaded on to in india so it is it is essentially that indian these uh, trucks will either have to return back empty handed or they can be loaded with goods only from pakistan not from india so this was the agreement that was agreed earlier also so pa- this clearly shows that pakistan has always been scared when it comes to india's de- uh, ties with afghanistan apart from this india also has a, a trilateral uh, transit agreement when it comes to afghanistan with iran through the chabahar port earlier we even said shipments of wheat through the chabahar port hence india has been providing a lot of aid to afghanistan next moving on pm's economic economic advisory council india's principal economic advisor mr sanjeev sanyal has been inducted into the economic advisory council to the prime minister as a full time member the economic advisory council to the prime minister is a non constitutional non statutory independent body constituted to give advice and economic uh, give advice on economic and related issues to government of india specifically to the prime minister hence it is an executive body it is it is not a constitutional body it's not a statutory body okay now it addresses these issues of macroeconomic importance such as inflation you know unemployment these are the issues that it addresses and gives advice to the prime minister to deal with it its functions also include attending to any other task as may be decided by the prime minister from time to time hence the prime minister can also provide certain tasks to the economic advisory council in order to get its recommendations now inflation microfinance industrial output also it is to be remembered that the niti ayog is the body that serves as the nodal agency for the economic advisory council when it comes to administrative issues uh it is a niti ayog that helps out the economic advisory council when it comes to planning and budgeting purposes next the scheme for covid orphans has been extended pm cares for children we discussed the pm cares scheme earlier uh please go back to that video and see what are the brief uh, functions of this pm cares uh, pm cares what it does is that it is it is not audited it is a trust with the prime minister as its chairperson 
and it has other members such as the defense minister the finance minister and the others okay now however uh, the cag cannot inquire into the usage of funds under pm cags also the parliament cannot inquire into usage of funds under the con- under the pm cags because pm cags does not form does not form a part of consolidated fund of india and hence the government cannot ask any questions regarding it and there is a lot of uh, opaqueness surrounding the functioning of pm cares the ministry of women and child development said on tuesday that pm care scheme for children orphaned by pi- covid-19 pandemic has been extended till february 2018 all those children will also be covered under the pm care scheme now the scheme covers all children who have lost both the parents only surviving parent the legal guardians or adoptive parents due to covid to avail the scheme a student should not have turned 18 on the date of death of his or her parents if he is over the age of 18 he is not eligible under the scheme the scheme provides funding for education and health and a monthly stipend from the age of 18 years apart from a lump sum amount of rupees 10 lakhs when a beneficiary turns 23 years old he is given a stipend after he turns 18 and he is also given rupees 10 lakh after he reaches 23 years of age now the education expenses of younger children will be supported by way of admission to the kendriya vidyalayas and private schools up to higher secondary levels see from when registered under the scheme say a person's parents die when he is age of 10 till 18 the government takes care of education through kendriya vidyalayas and it sponsors education even in private schools okay however after these 18 years are over for higher education the government sponsors them not through enrolling the children in uh, private colleges but rather it gives the scholarship equivalent to the tuition fees or it helps in educational loans where the interest on the loan will be paid by the pm cares fund okay and still 18 years it's one and from 18 years it's another okay all children will be enrolled as beneficiaries under the ayushman bharat scheme please read the features of this uh, ayushman bharat scheme pradhan mantri jan arogya yojana under this they have provisioning of rupees 5 lakh per family however all over here all children have 5 lakhs individually to themselves itself uh, okay the premium amount will be paid by pm care still a child turns 18 years of age next moving on now china russia are arming the myanmar junta who says this according to the un special report here on rights in myanmar he believes that china and russia are arming the myanmar junta to commit crimes against their own citizens he has urged the security council to convene an emergency session to debate and vote on a resolution and at least ban armed transfers you cannot prevent these uh, countries from aiding uh, myanmar but you can at least prevent the arms transfer that is currently happening according to the un special rapporteur he believes that russia and china continue to provide the myanmar military with fighter jets armored vehicles and in case of russia it has even fo- promised future arms so this will be used to undermine the rights of myanmar's own citizens now please uh, uh, read regarding the rohingya crisis in myanmar the world's largest ethnically persecuted people according to the un and also recently the national unity government under aung san suu kyi was removed and democracy was removed and the myanmar military took up through a military coup took up power okay 
and hence there have been a lot of protests against the military occupying uh, the government and the military has used an iron hand to suppress these protesters to quell these protesters next Nepal will be the first foreign country to adopt India's UPI system. Okay, please remember that UPI system is something that has been designed by the National Payments Corporation of India. Now, this National Payments Corporation of India has designed UPI and UPI serves as a medium for different banks to interact on a real-time basis. So, it is nothing but an interface where if at all you are using SBA and if at all the person who you are dealing with is using HDFC. You don't need to do an RTGS or NEFT or any other problem. Okay, you can directly transfer money through UPI which is a real-time solution instead of uh, waiting for uh, any uh, transaction time. And it is not controlled by any banks. It is rather controlled by the National Payments Corporation of India. Now, the National Payments Corporation of India has announced that the neighboring country of Nepal will be the first foreign country to adopt India's UPI system. The Unified Payments Interface is an instant real-time payment system allowing users to transfer money on a real-time basis across multiple bank accounts without revealing details of one's bank account to the other party. You realize that in UPI, there is no concept of even revealing the idea of bank account. Now, this provides more security to people and it also reduces the transaction cost. Okay. Now, UPI is currently the biggest among the National Payments Corporation of India's various uh, systems, including the National Automated Clearing House, the I I IMPS, the AEPS, Aadhaar Enabled Payment uh, System, uh, Bharat Bill Payment System, Rupee services, all of these are uh, systems which are built by the National Payments Corporation of India. But of all of them, this uh, UPI is the biggest one. Why? Because it had in the uh, calendar year 2021, January to December, it had around 38 billion transactions amounting to around 71 trillion rupees. 38 billion transactions amounting to 71 trillion rupees. It's a huge number and it beats all the other uh, systems which are in play right now in terms of share volume and uh, value. Now, to use this UPI, there are various apps like Phone Pay. You can use Phone Pay, Paytm, Google Pay. In fact, Google Pay works only through UPI. While in Phone Pay, you also have a wallet. Uh, in Paytm also you have a wallet concept. Uh, now, now this Beam app is the government's own app. Like Phone Pay, it is the government's app. It's India's digital payment application that works through UPI. It was also developed by the National Payments Corporation of India. It uh, shows the real-time transfer of funds. The Beam app has three levels of authentication and hence it is highly protected. Firstly, the app binds to the device's ID and mobile number, which means that the registered app can work only on the registered device. Now, because it uh, binds on to the device's ID and the mobile number, if you're trying to log in on an other phone using the same account, it won't work. Okay, next, a user needs to sync whichever bank account in order to conduct the transaction. Third, whenever a user sets up the app, they have a PIN. So this is the third layer of security, which is needed to log in in order to authorize these transactions. You need this PIN in order to authorize transactions. First is the UPI getting binded with devices ID and mobile number. And then the second one is the bank account getting registered on that particular uh, user's device and the third thing is the pin that is needed to open the beam application okay that's it